Greeny, when you've got a home project, how do you find a pro you can trust? I ask a coworker. Well, can a coworker do a background check on the pros, show you thousands of customer reviews, or instantly book an appointment for you? No, they definitely can't. Well, Home Advisor can, and they do it all for free. Just go to HomeAdvisor.com, and your project will be matched with the best background checked pros in your area. Nice. So next time, don't bug Dan in accounting. Just go to HomeAdvisor.com or download the free Home Advisor app. Greeny, you know how to win at business? Tell me how. Show up early for meetings. That way, everybody who's only on time looks like slackers. Well, I got a better way to win at business. What's that? Instant free nights at La Quinta Inns and Suites. You can show up with no advance reservation and redeem your La Quinta Returns loyalty points for a free night that same night just by using the La Quinta app. I feel like I'd win at business more than you. I'd cream you at business. Impossible. I'm undefeated at business. Go to LQ.com now and prepare to win at business. It is our pleasure to welcome into our studio our friends Bob Lee and Jeremy Schapp, who are both relaunching uh, very well-known ESPN journalistic brands in all new and exciting ways. And we have a million different things to get into with both of them. Gentlemen, good morning. Good morning, here, guys. Uh, let's start with obviously the most important question. Yes. And, and this is one of those days, and you guys know how this stuff works. No, we don't like each other. <laughs> is it? No. <laughs> That's the... it, it's, it's even less uh, germane than yeah. that. Um, you know, you can do a four-hour sports talk show as we do, and then you sort of get sidetracked into something, and it's all anyone wants to talk about. So I won't prejudice the jury. I will merely ask the original Rocky movie. What, what is your, your thoughts? A great movie, not great. What are your thoughts? Fantastic. Deserve best picture. Better than network. Okay, phenomenal. And? Deserve the Oscar, and when you put it in the context of Stallone's career and how it came to be and where he was in his life, even a greater achievement. So this is where we are. The context of the movie question is the fact that basically the word Kobe Bryant used preordained Golden State and Cleveland in the finals. So the question came, would you sit through a bad movie if you knew the last five minutes of it were fantastic. So basically, you're going to watch this whole NBA season knowing that you can get a seven-game series and it would be fantastic. So people were sending in movies, sending in movies, and I'm embarrassed to say, I'm not a good enough father or husband. My son, Mike, who does a show on this network, and my wife of just about 30 years, both said Rocky won overrated. Wow. Oh, my Lord. That's yeah. horrific, well, isn't it? <laughs> Look at Bob's reaction. It, it cleaves on maybe gender and generational lines. <laughs> my wife's my age. Okay, my I son's I said gender not. and generational oh, gen- okay, lines. Okay, yeah. Okay. Mike, All right. Yeah. <laughs> Mike, explain thing? what gender I, means here. Yeah, you're right. The, the, so the second hits. you said cleaves, you pretty much I'm lost sorry. him. That was, yeah. Oh, I thought of a Wepner big cleaver. There you go. I yeah. want one of those. What's that? that? The Wepner movie is out now, right? Chuck. Yeah. Which, you know, it's the same thing. How many people have had... Liev Schreiber and Sylvester Stallone essentially portray them on film. Yeah. The Bayonne Bleeder. There you go. Your but fellow. Rocky over, I mean, come on. What did I do wrong in the Golik House? Well, I mean, we don't I have enough the time. Show, I yeah, yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Mike and Mike, all right, coming up in about 20 minutes, we're going to give you the word. We're going to give you the ways to enter, and you could win a trip to the entire NBA Finals. You and a guest on your way to all the games of the NBA Finals. That's brought to you by Dell for Small Business. Before we start talking about what's coming up with you guys, a live weekly edition of E60 debuting this Sunday morning, 9, 9 a.m. Eastern, with the two of you guys hosting. Um, that is the new era of Sunday morning journalism on ESPN, replacing one that was a signature of this network for three decades, um, hosted uh, original, or most famously, you know, Jeremy, by your dad, right. Dick Schaap, the sports reporters, which came to an end this weekend. And I was fascinated not only watching all of those reporters talking about it at the end, but just with the reaction that so many people around the industry and across the world of sports had of how significant that show was. There's a few thoughts from you guys on that before we go forward. Oh, I mean, for me, I was in college when the show went on the air in 1988, uh, it was part of my life for 29 years. My father hosted it from 88 up until his death in 2001. And, you know, it it set the standard for conversation about sports on TV among reporters. Um, you know, the guys have been friends my whole life. I, I love the show. I always love the show. For 17 years every Sunday morning, by the way, through the artifice of television, you may not realize at home, right here is where the OTL set which is currently being replaced about a half mile over that way in Studio mm. Z. <laughs> this is where we've done our show for the most part for the last few years. But for 17 years on Sunday morning at the end of Outside the Lines, I would toss to Dick initially, then for the last X years to, to, to the late John Saunders. That's been a part of my professional as well as personal life, watching the show. And, yes, it, 
it, I think it created an entire genre of television and of journalism. Uh, you know, your dad was part of the new journalism in years past, all those, those great young Turks of another age. And I think that show brought us to yet another place of journalism. How did it change, like, decade to decade, what it meant to sports, that The show? sports reporters? Well, I think initially, if you go back and you look at the show in its first few seasons, it was more of a sports media discussion. It wasn't as specifically about the games, the games from the night before Saturday night, the games coming up Sunday in that week. Uh, and it was more it was more of an issue show and it became more on the games. And then, of course, you know, it spawned all these other shows. I mean, PTI and Around the Horn, First Take, they all in some way uh, owe their existence to the sports reporters, which, you know, was the dominant form in the genre. Um my, my dad had a lot of great jobs. It was the thing that he loved doing the most, sitting on that set, uh, getting to pick on Lupica. That was, that was <laughs> which, which that was is a national part. blood sport. <laughs> if not, yeah, we love you, Mike. <laughs> Bob Lee and Jeremy Schapper here. And so now um, a, a, a relaunch, if you will. How would you describe what yeah. it is? I've seen a lot of the press material and um, have talked to you guys about it a little bit. I know my wife Stacy did as well. But how would you describe for the audience what it is we are relaunching and what will be different starting this weekend? Well, E60 has a permanent home. This guy finally has a place to, to take that show, which has wandered like uh, in the desert. We've met at various oases. 40 years. Yeah, he's, he's biblical. <laughs> almost. almost. 10. 9 a.m. Sunday morning <laughs> and relaunching outside of the lines, both in a brand new studio. If you guys popped your head over to Studio Z, which is kind of like the, the Jetsons family room. It's yes. in the round. It's a lot smaller than this, but we've got screens everywhere. And I think our show over the last year, I think, has seen a great uh, 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 modest ratings increase, which is big in current terms. It's higher story count. We've done a lot of different topics. And in tandem with, you know, Outside the Lines can be very much a part of E60 every Sunday morning. I keep telling Bob, the Jetsons are outside the demo. Let's try to <laughs> yeah. cut Space back the might be there. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. I mean, you know, it's unusual for a it's show Mike. that's been on for a decade uh, to suddenly find itself in this situation going from, you know, 12 or 15 shows a year to 52 shows a year, a consistent slot. Sunday mornings, which we know lend itself well to this kind of storytelling, long form journalism. And it's a great opportunity to do the kind of to do more of the kind of work that that outside the lines in E60 have been doing for so long. It's an important time to be doing it as well. And there there are not that there ever weren't things to talk about, but I think there is an increased spotlight and increased interest on a lot of issues in and around the sports world. I think we appreciate or we understand it for being a microcosm of our greater society more than we ever have before. So what in your mind right now, Bob, if, if you were to make a list of the handful of biggest issues that are of, of the greatest interest and the greatest impact to American sports fans today, what would you point to? Well, it's, for example, you say American sports fans today. We're going to have a story on Sunday morning that was shot in six countries around the world, none of them here in the United States. It's about the Syrian national soccer football team. And you say, well, why will Americans buy into this? Well, you've got the Syrian civil war, a huge globally uh, observed tragedy. It's a human story of the tragedies in Syria, of the decisions these players face. Can I afford to play for this team, for the Assad regime? Can I afford not to? What are all the consequences of this? Stories of human justice. The stories, for example, that Jeremy has done in Qatar of the workers' conditions for the World Cup of 2022. There are all sorts of things. They're not just sports stories. They're human stories, and they have a footing on the field of play. But they, I think they reach into the heart, and that's the key. And I think we have the time and space on Sunday mornings now. People like Mike, put your foot up, relax, and come along and let us tell you a story. We have a lot of good stories to tell. Are we where we are, Jeremy, because maybe of social media and the worlds have now are, 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 have collided more? It's not just sports. is so much separate well, I, than I, everything I else. I think you're absolutely right. I think um, there's a, an awareness now because of social media, because of the Internet in general, because of satellite television. The world is in our living rooms. It's on our phones in a way that it hasn't been before. Uh, it's, it's been made clear to us over the past decade at E60 that there is interest in these international stories and social justice issues and also in quirky stuff. I mean, it's a, it's a true magazine show in the sense that you've got the heavy stuff. I mean, it doesn't get heavier than the Syria report from Steve Fainaru, which is remarkable. But, but there's also the profile. There's room for the superstar athlete profile. We've got Dak Prescott this week. There's room for the quirky stuff. I mean, Bob and I were watching the other day. We've got a piece coming up in the next few weeks. It's about the youngest ever qualifier for the National Spelling Bee. This five-year-old girl from Tennessee. You've seen her. Yes, yes. I mean, she is gold it's she unreal is tv gold yeah. and, and and it might be the best thing i've seen produced on television in years and so you know 
the tone's going to vary. Uh, the story length is going to vary. Uh, week two is a full hour just on Ryan Leaf, which is remarkable stuff from Tom Rinaldi. Saw that with yeah, him. With, we had him at the yeah, draft we yeah, down there. Yeah. And to where he was, what he was, admittedly, as he says, the worst, the biggest bust in the history of the National Football League. He was here doing a car wash, as we call it, about five and a half years ago. Uh, and three days after that car wash, he relapsed again into the usage of prescription drugs and told me in Philadelphia a couple of weeks ago that a whole experience of being here contributed to that. Wow. Then went was sentenced to seven years in prison, got out after, I believe, three and a half years, and is dedicating himself to sobriety and to, to helping other people. It is an astonishing film, and that will be week two. Mike and Mike, Jeremy, Shap, Bob Lee are with us in our studio with the Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless, best phones, best networks, half the cost. Another of the things, the things that we cover most regularly here on our show, um, and this I think would fall under the lines uh, of an outside the lines, I can just envision you doing these interviews, are, are the issues involving head trauma, concussions, and things like that, and primarily in football, but it came up this week in hockey in a oh. very big way. And we talked about it. We had you, you Which laughing. century is the NHL in, yeah. the 20th or the 21st? It was bizarre, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the entirety of that, it, it feels like something that they are just paying lip service to because someone told them they have to. But it isn't really something that they're buying into being significant. To me, this is... Sports as we know them, particularly professional football, staring its mortality in the face. That 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 when you when you read stories like the one that MMQB had this week about Nick Bonacani, that is going to get people talking to me. That that to me is the issue that may be the mortality of pro football as we know it. Well, that's the pinnacle of interest, right? The the, the pipeline issue. I know your wife Chris has worked a lot mm-hmm. with USA Football right. on this and heads up. I mean that people look at that that gets the most attention. This is a public health issue. For kids, for the U.S. military, a lot of the most important information and research has been done in tandem between sports leagues, the uh, neurological researchers, and the military. Um, and you talk about the hockey situation. I mean, they're, they're right now the league facing what the NFL confronted, which was a class action lawsuit. And now the discovery is coming out. And you're seeing some things that have been written in emails and documents that show in recent years, an attitude that no other league has exhibited. This is something that parents are looking at. This is going to affect who's playing football, who's playing lacrosse. It's not, you know, football is in the center of it. You and I have talked about this a yes. lot, and, and your wife and I, she's been a guest on our program, yep. in fact, right, right on this very set. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is, football is in the focus. The National Football League has made a commitment to this, but still, there is that legacy. It's not just Buona County, the Jim Kick situation. Yeah. SI follows up. And it's distressing because these stories on one level are each – so unique and painful, but they start to feel and sound the same. And now you see the linkage with ALS, which is part of the settlement package with the NFL. This is a, a question that's going to ripple for years and, and continue and, to ripple. And it's in its infancy. It really is yeah. just getting started in terms of the science, in terms of the stories, in terms of the right. impact on different sports. On E60 a couple of years ago, we did a story about the first soccer player. Uh, in whose brain CTE was found uh, post-mortem, uh, a guy named Patrick Grage, who was the youngest ALS victim in the state of New Mexico. I mean, so we're, we're, the rules are changing, uh, uh, particularly in youth sports. You know, heading is out in most leagues for right. kids. Up till uh, 10 or something like yeah, that. The 12, yeah, the collision sports, this is existential. Um, and nobody knows where it's going to end up. Well, and, and, and they have to be made aware of it. it j- just the fact of what hockey's rule was written as the spotters and how they would deem it the ice, not the board. I mean, it's just I mean, <laughs> you just have to you have to acknowledge what's going on now and jump into this and, and, and be responsible for it. So I think that'll change it. But I think one of the other things going on, Jeremy, I'll start with you, is athletes more now than ever have been involved in social issues. Yeah. So that, again, is where the sports world and the real world are meeting. And there may be no bigger name now than Colin Kaepernick of what he got involved with and the vitriol he felt from that. And now the guy can't even find a job. And people are still saying it's because he's not a very good quarterback. Yet we see some of the quarterbacks in the league and go, wait a minute, how the hell can that guy have a job and Kaepernick not? It's been a huge shift the last few years. You know, for decades, people in the media – kind of lamented the fact that these athletes who had these incredible platforms didn't use them uh, in any sense for anything other than promoting their brands. They did everything they could to protect those brands. Didn't want to alienate, of course, Michael Jordan, Republicans, etc., whether or not that's exactly what he said. Uh, that's shifted significantly in the last few years in particularly, uh, in particular, especially the last year and a half since we got into the election season for 2016. I was at the game at the Barclays Center where LeBron James suddenly you know, decided he was going to wear the I Can't Breathe t-shirt. Uh, and when you've got LeBron James, arguably the biggest sports star on the planet, engaged, 
you know, it, 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 of course, LeBron James's brand is untouchable. It's bulletproof at this point. But I think that inspires other people to say, if, if LeBron James can do it, I can do it. If Colin Kaepernick can risk everything, I should also consider, you know, what's the right thing to do here, not just about getting the next contract, getting the next endorsement. Uh, and that's something we've covered and something we have to continue to cover because, you know, it's an issue in clubhouses, in locker rooms, between management and players. We've seen it between coaches and players in Buffalo in particular. And it's getting bigger as the polarization in our society has gotten. And then so to spin that to the next part of it, Bob, we will then hear certainly people who do what Mike and I do here will hear from our audience frequently. Stick to sports, guys. We just want you to stick to sports. Is that possible in 2017? Well, I'll tell you what, there was some research into the decline in NFL ratings last year that suggested the Kaepernick protest was part of the and in one case, in one piece of research was the leading reason I in my gut. I don't know if that's the case. Um, this is it gets to a political discussion because I, I think a lot of people feel and we've seen it, I think, in our own little universe here in the last ESPN universe. What would happen politically if a critical mass of athletes began talking about right to life or the Second Amendment? It would be a very different discussion. So this is how it resonates. It's a red state, blue state issue. And I think you hear and feel a lot of that pushback from people. Uh, you know, the whole Kaepernick thing. Is he being you know, redlined or blacklisted at the moment. I mean, what responsibility does a National Football League team have? Good quarterback, does he fit into our system? But the circus that comes with it, do you want to import that for a backup quarterback? I mean, what's a backup quarterback? He's like a jack. He's in the trunk. You take him out when you need him, right? Yeah. and a lot. Wear the ball cap, keep your mouth shut. And a lot of times the backup quarterback's the the, the most popular guy because you can't wait to scream to get him in, you know, when when your starter is is not playing well. Yeah, there there are two separate and distinct issues, I think, with Kaepernick not getting signed. There's the how do you feel about his politics, and then how do you feel about distractions in general? And I know a lot of people out there are assuming that the stance he took last year uh, is the reason he hasn't been signed, but I, I think it's just as problematic for teams that it's just a distraction. And right. the last but thing you want from a backup quarterback is any is kind of distraction. But two very different cultures, National Football League and the NBA. I mean, Adam Silver I got out in front of the Clippers thing he a did. couple of years ago, had to, did so, was rightly lauded for what he did. That was an untenable situation and has reached out to Michelle Roberts on the social activism issue. He's just asked the players not to wear things on the court, but I don't think there's any, despite what the National Football League says, and they can say this, but when you look at the political composition of, of the two respective leagues and, and the signals that have been said, that's a different atmosphere in the NFL. Without and a players doubt. say it openly. Without a doubt. They both have handled it differently. Yeah. One other thing I really want to ask you guys, I'm sorry, Mike, but we're going to run out of time here because what you guys are doing and what you guys have both done, and I think uh, commendably, is a, 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 a form of journalism that is, I'm not going to say it's disappearing, that would be a terrible way to look at it, but it's a form of journalism that sometimes I think is more difficult to find in an era where everyone has a voice, where everyone has a platform in this era of social media, in an era where anything can be called, anything you want it to call, um, you have to try and figure out who's telling you what and what you can believe. How has doing legitimate journalism, and I'll put air quotes around that for whatever reason, how has that changed in 2017 from what it might have been 10 years ago or before? The principles are still the same. I think there's the, the difference, the contrast is more stark because of what you We live in a world of hot takes. We live in a world of Twitter. We live in a world of 140 characters. You have to have a take immediately. Uh, our principles, I, I, I think I speak for you with this. I mean, it's still, you know, the inverted pyramid. Uh, you write, Fairness. You know, exactly. You know, you, you write as well as you can. Fairness, accuracy, knock on the front door, do your due diligence. And if that stands out as unique, that says more about everything surrounding us than it does us. Fairness to the subject, fairness to the audience. In sports specifically, what's gotten tougher is access. I mean, there's no doubt yeah. about that. Uh, you walk into locker rooms and clubhouses, and it's toxic, uh, that, that wall separating the players from the people who cover them. And breaking through that wall is tougher than ever. Why do you think the Players' Tribune has done so? Oh, without a right? doubt. And players, I, I understand. Yes. And by the way, as, as a business, I yep. salute it immensely. Without because a doubt. Because it's, it's, all right, maybe it's a little bit ghost-written, but it's there, and they don't have to deal Nothing with it. Nothing against ghost-writing, Bob. Like, yeah. well, I know that. But they do. They, they, they <laughs> put you through college. <laughs> they get to the thumb their nose it's at the literally media a little bit. They, they do. Well, it's a thumb your nose, but listen – not everybody does their job as not every radio host, not every TV anchor, not every reporter, not every athlete is mutually you know confident and understanding. They're 
I can understand why it's been a success. A live weekly edition of E60 debuts this Sunday, 9 a.m. Eastern on ESPN. Bob Lee and Jeremy Schapp are the hosts. And, and guys, best of luck with this. And obviously, everyone will be watching and excited. And we look forward to chatting as we continue down the road. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you. A lot of good karma here on this set. Yeah. Enjoy it, guys. <laughs> Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans proudly supports Mike and Mike. When it comes to the big decision of choosing a mortgage lender, it's important to work with someone you can trust who has your best interests in mind. With Rocket Mortgage, you'll get a transparent online process that gives you the confidence you need to make an informed decision. Skip the bank, skip the waiting, and go completely online at quickenloans.com slash mics. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states. NMLSconsumeraccess.org number 3030. The Adnan Verk movie podcast yesterday was the one-year anniversary of this podcast, which which reaches enormous critical acclaim. Uh, and Adnan is with us. I'm Mike and Mike. Good morning, Adnan. <laughs> Great to be with you, Greeny and Gola. Greeny, you forgot award-winning. Let's just go and throw that hyperbole in there. Award-winning podcast, and we'll make up the award, and nobody will catch us. There right? you go. Nice. No question. All the ones that you really want. So let, let's start with this. Before we, we get into the one particular movie that has become – the the um, the source of great conflict now in the Golic family. Let's just ask a general question this way, because we were trying to come up with a comparison of what the NBA playoffs feel like. They're like a movie that is <laughs> that is tedious and long and not worth it. But the ending is so good that in the, we walk out of it thinking it was a good movie, and, we, and all we remember is the ending, and it kind of saves it. And that's what we're counting on the Warriors and Cavaliers doing. Give me a movie that falls in that category where it's really not a great movie, but the ending is so spectacular that the movie itself is remembered as greater than it deserves. Sure. I love the analogy, Mike. The, the first two that come to mind, of course, M. Night Shyamalan. He's known for these... You know, average movies and the ending's incredible. So The Sixth Sense is the first one I think of. If, if you go back and watch it again, you go, yeah, okay, it's all right, but the ending's incredible once you figure out what, you know, Bruce Wallace is all about. I don't want to spoiler alert, 20 years later. Yeah. <laughs> Unbreakable is another one, right? Right? Unbreakable is another one. Sam Jackson and Bruce Wallace. Again, fine movie, okay, comic book story. The ending, you go, oh, okay, now I figure it out. So those two are the ones that immediately come to mind. And I know, Green, you went apoplectic earlier about the usual suspects. And I'll say this. The way you set it up, I don't want to say it was awful until the ending, but it was a good movie, but then the ending is incredible, and it lifts it to this different stratosphere. Uh, but usual suspects is another one I think of, just in terms of the ending is so incredible. Not that the rest of the way wasn't good. It was fine, but the ending is, is spectacular. How about how about cur- more current movies, movies that, that have been out the last couple of years? Did you like, like? I threw out the movie Arrival with Amy Adams. I, I liked the movie. I didn't love it, but I thought the ending what a what was pretty was pretty wild with the twist. Yeah, Mike, that's a great one. Actually, you're right because the rest of it again, it kind of slow paced. It's very kind of methodical. It's not your typical science fiction action movie. You know, kind of brainier. It's a little like I said, slower paced. But then the ending's fantastic. It, that redeems it because you go, oh wow, there's a lot of emotional resonance and drama that you wouldn't expect in that kind of a movie. Um, I saw somebody else throwing out Inception. That came out a few years ago. I thought that was a pretty good movie start to finish. But again, the ending is so spectacular. It definitely does elevate the rest of the movie. Um, speaking of the, the fraction within the Golic family, though, I understand Rocky right now is in dispute. Who, yes. who is disputing? Rocky oh, is not great from start to finish. That's a great movie. Let, start to finish. Let me just tell you, my son Mike, who, again, was born 14 years after the movie came out, uh, but also mm-hmm. my my lovely, darling, almost 30 years of my life wife, Chris, <laughs> agreed with Mike saying it was overrated. So my son, who is a like, like you, a movie buff, and my wife both right. think Rocky is overrated. No, listen, I'll say this. I, I will agree with Chris and Mike only in this. I'm offended by the fact that one best picture over two much superior films in Taxi Driver and Network. Now, that's, that's, that has nothing to do with Rocky, though. Like, that shouldn't diminish them just because the Oscars got it wrong. On its own, if you just watch Rocky, there's no doubt that's a captivating story. And I, and I think what hurts it, like you said, maybe the age issue. Because for Mike Jr., he doesn't realize how popular these underdog stories are. At that time, that was rather bold to do this story, but some boxer from Philly punching stocks of meat. And then that ending, the fact that he doesn't win, the studio was like, what? How can you do this story? And even the back story is amazing. The fact Stallone wrote the script would only get it made if he got to play the lead role. I, I would disagree with both of them. I'm, I'm on Mike Senior's side there. Rocky's great from start to finish. To go from there, my son Mike actually said the love story between Rocky and Adrian stinks. I, I don't know who he is. You talk with him a lot of times more than I do about movies, Adnan. I mean, where is this coming from? 
I'm going to have to text him. I think he's been soured. You know, Mike Jr. has been tweeting a lot about those Brad Pitt pictures. That uh, He just did some magazine profile talking about yeah. his breakup. So I think, I think Mike Jr. is taking that breakup of Brangelina and now transferring it to other movie relationships. It's kind of souring him on romance in general. Um, and if I could try as hard as I can to to take this and put it back into a place yeah, good luck. that people came here to hear in the first place, do you agree with the analogy? Because I'm getting a little pushback from Golik here on on the on, on the premise in the first place. That to me, this NBA basically the the foregone conclusion that is the NBA Finals has taken a lot of the enjoyment out of this particular NBA postseason for me. Has it for you? Greeny, I can crystallize it with this. We the North became we the sweep. All right, Canada's team, the Toronto Raptors, in rather feeble fashion, bowed down to King James and the Cavaliers in four rather uneventful games. So, yes, that to me has been the story of the second round, certainly the NBA playoffs. They're definitely lacking in drama. Even if you argue a series that's 3-2 like Boston and Washington, it hasn't been compelling. The home teams won every time. Last night was a blowout. You know, Spurs and Rockets, there was one great game, obviously the Ginobili ending with Game 5, but the Rockets, the two games they won were blowouts. I completely agree. I, I cannot wait. I think the final is going to be tremendous. That's, that's the final we're all hoping for. Uh, and hopefully it can redeem the rest of what has been, for me, rather lackluster. I, I, I guess where I had disagreed, and I went further than, than the playoffs, Adnan, is, is we all thought on July 4th when Kevin Durant went to Golden State that the preordained finals was Golden State in Cleveland, yet we still had a whole entire NBA regular season of which we again had an attendance record and ratings were good. So I, I, everyone keeps wanting to say how bad it is because it's lopsided, yet people showed up in record amount and the ratings were good. My equa- equating to that was you go to a, a, a uh, amusement park and you wait three hours in line for a roller coaster that you know was only a minute and a half long, but you wait for it because you want that ending. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt, Mike, there's something to be said for investment. And I would agree that if you don't watch any NBA basketball and you just turn on – Game six, Warriors, Cavs. All right, let's just pick this thing up. You're not going to have the same enjoyment that the rest of us do when you watch it all season long. And that includes some of the pitfalls. That that includes having to suffer through the agony of some games that are boring and, and uneventful because eventually you go, no, this redeems it all. It's like it's like watching a bad movie. Then the ending ends up being better. So the amusement park analogy, I agree with you, works. In fact, my family and I went to Disney World recently. Two words, fast pass. That, that will save you on those yeah. lines to anybody <laughs> looking to go. But that, that's a separate issue for another day. But, but there is a counter to that, Mike, which because you made the analogy earlier, and it's yeah. a good one. But the other side of it is how many people might ride roller coasters that don't because there's a two-hour rate. You know what I mean? Like there are, got, there are some people who will wait there two hours yeah. to go on the roller coaster. But how many people look at it and say, yeah, I'm not going. just too long. I'm yeah. not going. So, look, I'm not suggesting that the NBA is staring its mortality in the face. They're about to get the highest-rated NBA final they've seen. In fr- if this thing goes six or seven games, the entire country, the entire world is going to be captivated. And right. for all the right reasons, it will be phenomenal, or it has a chance to be phenomenal. But it did, and I've got numbers here. Hembo went back and did the. It looked up the numbers. The road to the final has never been anywhere near as easy for any team in 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 going back now thirty forty years of the best NBA right. teams yeah. as it has been for these Cavaliers, and that takes some of the steam out of it. All right, and then um, what's the greatest movie ever made? Uh- <laughs> Casablanca, Greedy, right? That's an easy one. Did you, how great was the book, by the way? I enjoyed the book a lot. Did you read the book? It was excellent. We'll have to yeah. get you on Cinephile. You can give your own recap, the Greedy review of it. But you, so you say that nicely because, you know, it's my favorite. What is your favorite? I've never asked you. What is your favorite movie ever made? Well, you know, it's a three-way tie. Raging Bull, Taxi Driver, Goodfellas. You got De Niro, you got Scorsese. You can't go wrong with either of those two guys, right? Actually... Goodfellas is one of the movies that was suggested by a tweeter earlier yep. today as one that's not good until the ending, and I almost fell out of my chair. <laughs> that person needs to get banned from Twitter. They're never going to be allowed to tweet again. Casablanca is a Rick Sutcliffe, our boy. Hey, our boy Sutcliffe tweeted in Scent of a Woman. How can you not love Scent of a Woman stuff yeah. to finish? Come on. People, people had that as well. Casablanca is a book. There's a book? No, no. They just wrote a book about the making. <laughs> oh, they wrote a book about it? Yeah. Oh. Uh, he is the cinephile. He is Adnan Verk. You can check out his podcast. Thank you so much, Adnan. Guys, I'm filling it on Tuesday. Me and Booger. Plenty of hockey talk. Can't wait. Appreciate okay. it. <laughs> 
And now, insurance-minded speeches from GEICO. Hardship. My grandmother would go through it every month to pay her insurance bill. First, she would handwrite a paper check, in cursive. Then, using her own tongue, she would wet a stamp for an envelope. Today, however, we need not weary our hands and tongues. Today, we can pay our GEICO bill with the GEICO app. Away with hardship, in with bill pay on the GEICO app. Thank you. All right, so I think I've got one. Again, the, the, the topic is... Name a movie where the ending was so good that it saved the movie for you. Right. That made watching the whole movie worthwhile when you didn't enjoy the rest of the movie. And I'll tell you in all honesty, Leon just suggested this one. And it's very recent. La La Land. I, oh, see, I liked La La I Land. I loved the ending of La La Land. I, and I did not like the whole movie. I did like the ending of La I wish it would end it a little differently. But from an ending standpoint, I did like the ending. I liked it. I surprisingly, I went into that one not sure what I was going to feel about it. And I liked it. I did like it. I did not especially like it. Um, I found myself bored through a lot of it, but I loved the ending. Okay, so let's give you the numbers on this. Legler brought it up, and Hembo did the research. So the Cavaliers in the conference playoffs during this little mini run, meaning since LeBron's return, are now 32-4 and four in the East against their own right. conference competition. They, of course, will have one more series coming up here against either Boston or Washington. LeBron and the, and the big four with the Heat – you want to take a guess what their record, what, what their winning percentage? So that, that's a winning percentage of basically 89%. Okay. They've lost four games. When he was with the Heat, so in the conference playoffs, take a rough guess what their winning percentage was in the East. In the 70s? It's 75%. They lost 16 games. Okay. Remember, Indiana took them to seven tough games that one year. Right. How much more fun was that than this? <laughs> I mean, that was exciting and interesting. I remember Roy Hibbert was becoming like a, a, a factor and Paul George and LeBron were going head-to-head and all that kind of stuff. I mean, even the Bulls put up a fight against them when the Bulls were, were dramatically undermanned, if you will. Remember the Bulls, they're shoving LeBron to the ground. Yeah, yeah. Right now, you're watching these teams. It's almost, you remember when the Dream Team was playing, the yeah. original Dream Team, and guys on the other teams looked like they wanted to take pictures with them. I think one guy actually stopped a game well, now you're and going took a picture. Of my, there's so much deference going on here. These teams Teams, oh, let, let me rephrase There's it. not deference going there. Let there me there is it. not. There, 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 these teams no, nobody's, look, a, nobody's Angola trying to take a picture with these guys. These teams don't look to me like they genuinely believe they're going to win. There, there, might, disagree. there might be part of that. I could see that, that they just don't have the manpower to win. But, again, I mean, here we go, going nuts for a couple of years. It's cyclical. It'll stop. It'll stop at some so point. All I'm saying is that I don't like it now. I'm okay. not suggesting all it's right. the death there, knell there of the NBA. There's something that goes on in every sport at some point that you don't like that ends up changing over time. Yes, it's in a part now where we pretty much know who the finals are. I, I completely agree And we've with known you. it since July. Yes, and, and how many times do I need to co- keep going back? How much did it affect the regular season? Hardly at all. Right. I mean, it, it did affect it to some degree for some people. Sure, and sure. The, you look at the way they are themselves handling their regular seasons, it affects that a lot. Um, and I'm just looking back over some of the other historically great teams. They've got the two Michael Jordan runs with the Bulls. Um, his winning percentage in the Eastern Conference was extraordinarily high during those years. But it's not to me, it's not the overall winning percentage. If just looking at the first Bulls three-peat and the second Bulls three-peat. In the first Bulls three-peat, they had unbelievable series with the Knicks. I mean, memorable series, battles with the Knicks. They were down two games to none against the Knicks in 93, and they went seven games with the Knicks the first time. The second go-around, the second Jordan three-peat, um, you know, Reggie Miller's Indiana team had a great chance to beat them right down to the very end. In fact, I think Indiana was at home in, in that year in Game 7. And the Bulls wound up beating them. So they, 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 you, you saw them, to use your words, their eyes watered and their noses bloodied, and that made it much more compelling. I don't think anybody's arguing with your point that you're making. I'm not even arguing with your point. My point is it's not making a difference in how people are watching or taking in the NBA. I, that, that, that's my point against your point, because I agree with you. It is non-competitive now, and we're waiting till the finals. I completely agree with that, but I'm also willing to understand that in sports, things happen. Things happen, and they last a few years, and then they change. And this will, that'll happen with this as well. I get and, it. And until it does, 
I'm going to enjoy these two, these two teams meeting up in the finals. The conversation really came from Kobe Bryant saying, why does this bother right, anybody? Right. The fact that it's preordained, and, and that was really what began the yes. whole thing. A reminder, we've teamed up with our friends at Dell, giving you a chance to go to every game of the NBA Finals every day this week, so tomorrow, 7.20 and 9.20 a.m. Eastern. You hear the word of the day. You get the ways to enter. You get your chance to win. Brought to you by Dell for Small Business. Let's end it on another topic then. Barry Melrose in here talking about the Capitals need to trade Alex Ovechkin. He actually went so far as to say if you flip-flopped Ovechkin and Crosby over the years, he thinks the Capitals would have the Cups. How fair, in your opinion, is it to blame the superstar well, for a team that does not get where this team has not gotten? Well, I think it's unfair and fair. I, I, it's, it's a horrible answer. It's unfair because there's so many people out there that can help, but it's fair in the, in, in the stance that we put a lot on our stars. We put a lot on their shoulders to carry the load. So, and I don't even associate money with it. But for the most part, I, I guess the thought process here, could you be in a better spot depending on what you could get for Ovechkin and start over again? Will you be, will you be better off? I'd like to know that forgetting hockey. I'd like to know other sports. Forgetting just letting a guy go, figure we're past the time. Trading him. Taking a star and trading him in other sports where it worked out for you. Trading a star. Would, it be, would, would you go to Herschel Walker? Yeah, and again, you know? now that's – is that 30 years now? It's got I mean, it's, it's one of the first that jumped because it's one of the all-time great trades, one-sided, you yeah. know, trades. But you did you, – you, you traded away a star player, correct? Yeah. Now, Herschel Walker's pro career was nothing like his college career. Uh, he, he didn't – I don't think he hit what a lot of people thought he would in the NFL. But he was a good player. Yeah, he was a good player, yes. That's a good question. I mean, football, you don't see trades like right. that. That's why I'm often. just talking any sport. Basketball. I mean, a what? star traded away. And, and that it worked out for the and team it that out traded for the team, him. traded that person away. Because we've seen a lot of teams trade stars oh, yeah. and work out well for sure. the stars. Absolutely, yes. Uh, it's a good question. I don't have an immediate answer well, no, for I you. I wasn't hoping. I wasn't asking for that right now. 